Well, as we uh, come to our message this morning, it's uh, one, another one of those times. I plan my sermon six months at a time, and we're uh, pretty far along. Back in May would have been when I worked on these, and it's amazing the things that happened just this week that fit in with the message this morning. After spending nearly 25 years behind bars for a brutal crime that he didn't commit, Tony Wright is a free man. The Philadelphia resident was just 20 years old when he was convicted and sentenced to death in prison for the rape and stabbing of a neighbor more than two decades ago. Wright, now 44, walked out of prison this past Tuesday with his arms raised in the air. He held hands with his attorneys and members of the Innocence Project, a nonprofit legal organization based in New York City. Unbelievable, unbelievable, man. Best feeling in the world, man. I never felt like this in my entire life, Wright told WPVI TV in Philadelphia. We did it. I mean, today is our day. These were his expressions as he was leaving the prison. Lawyers with the in Innocent Project secured DNA evidence that showed Wright was not the one who committed the 1991 rape of his neighbor, 77-year-old Louise Talley, the rape and murder of her. On Tuesday, after deliberating for more than an hour, a jury found him not guilty, acquitting him of the rape and the murder. How do you replace 25 years of a man's life? Here's a man that's only 40 years old, or 45 years old, and uh, he's been in prison for more than half of that time. There was a judge who was trained, who was verified and certified. He was appointed or elected to his position. There was a jury of the man's peers. There was testimony by both the prosecution and the defense. All the information was given, and yet the decision was proven to be wrong. And Jesus reminds us, that we are not equipped nor entitled to judge others. He reminds us again of the Father's love, grace, and mercy that is extended to us, and that we should extend that same mercy and grace to other people. We're continuing in the sermon series, Greatest Sermon, and the message today is grace greater than law. We're in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 14, kind of coming to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The greatest sermon is not a sermon I preached, and you knew that, but uh, it is the sermon that is recorded in Scripture, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus spoke. And as we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told the disciples and the crowd that our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. You can find that in Matthew 5.20. He continues to teach them and us that grace is greater than the law and that we are not called nor capable of being judges. We are not to judge our fellow man. And so the first thing that we want to notice this morning, there is only one judge and it's not you. Okay, in case you were wondering about that, even if you have the position of a judge, there's only one true judge, and it is not you. The fact of the matter is, our human judgment is imperfect. Our, our human judgment is imperfect. In Matthew 7, 1 and 2, it says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the Measure you use, it will be measured to you. Again, I'm amazed at how God works. Uh, he gave me a perfect illustration for this sermon in my own inept ability to judge. I think it was Tuesday morning, the same morning that, uh, that Tony was set free from prison. I uh, pulled in to uh, fill my uh, convertible 
with gas. And I had the top down and the windows were down and it was a beautiful morning and I just kind of pulled in there uh, to, to get some gas. And there was a car on the other side of the, of the uh, gas pumps um, that had just pulled in right before me. And as I got out of my car, I looked and I saw on the passenger side there was a person who was sitting there and had a Panama Jack hat on. I think uh, I have that there. Yeah, it, just that style of a straw hat. Um, and, uh, and I looked at that person and I thought it, that, that it was an elderly gentleman sitting there. And so I, was, I would, wanted to encourage the man that was pumping the gas. My own father died just two months short of 12 years ago. And uh, what a wonderful thing it would have been. You know, I, don't, I didn't know if, if he was taking his dad out for breakfast or whether his dad lived with him. But I just wanted to give him a word of encouragement uh, that, uh, you know, it's great that you still have your father with you. And so I kind of went back and did what I needed to do and put the gas in and got it started. And I looked around the side of the pump and I said, um, is that your father with you in the car? And he said, what? He said, no, that's my wife. Whoops! <laughs> Is everybody awake now? Are you, you, okay, you're with me? And, uh, you know, there, there was no sign of hair. I don't know whether she had a short-style haircut or whether she may have had her hair pulled up under the hat or maybe she had had cancer treatments. I don't know. But I did not do a good job at all of judging who was on that front seat. Now, if you're an extrovert, you're saying, yep, preacher, I've been there, done that. If you're an introvert, you probably don't even know how many times you've misjudged people because you wouldn't have talked to the man on the other side of the pump. But uh, you probably would have still thought that that was uh, maybe his dad that was sitting there. Um, but we must remember that our own judgment is flawed and fallible. And Jesus is saying that to us when he says, why are you trying to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a plank that's sticking out of your own eye? You see, our judgment is flawed. And we're not going to take time for all of you to tell your stories uh, when, uh, when your judgment was flawed, but, it, but it's true. And you know, sometimes when, when we're in a situation and, and maybe uh, we've been offended in some way, uh, there's always two sides of a story. And, and we have a tendency to tell the story in such a way that our motives are right and our actions are right and the other person is wrong. And if they tell the story, they do the exact same thing. They tell how their motives are right and their actions uh, were right and, and the other person is wrong. And, and so we, we have a tendency to try to shape the truth to make ourselves look good. And Jesus said, hey, while you're trying to get that speck out of your brother's eye, there's a plank that's in your own that needs to be removed. And, and James, the brother of Jesus, wrote in James 4, 11 and 12, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? There's only one judge, James says, and it's not you. See, you can't blame me for saying that. That, I just, that point came from James, the brother of Jesus. There's only one judge, and it's not you. And when we judge others, we're taking God's place as judge. We, we need to stop to think about that. When we're looking at other people and we're saying, oh, well, their motives were this way and, you know, they shouldn't have done that and we're judging them, we're putting ourselves in the place where only God should sit. We're doing what only God is equipped to do. Our own understanding and perspective and judgment is impaired, but His is perfect. The second thing that we want to notice is that um, we are to relate to others in light of God's grace. Since our judgment is impaired, it's not perfect, 
We're not to judge them, but we are to take a positive approach to, the, to those others. And even if, they, if we think that they're wrong, we are to relate to others in light of God's grace. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it, the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. And then he goes on and he talks about how, you know, even as earthly parents, we know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more would God give his Holy Spirit to us if we but ask? And there are so many times that, that we don't have what God wants for us to have because we don't ask. And this isn't a way to, to all of a sudden get wealthy. It's not talking about everything that we want. It's not everything that, that would just please us. But this is in the, in the process of fulfilling God's will. If we're working to do what God would have us to do, God will provide everything that we need. Not just for our own comfort but for the completion of his will. And so when we come at life, we should consider all that God has given to us, not the weakness and the failures of others. Consider all that God has done for you, not the weakness or the failures of others. In Matthew chapter 18, there's a story of a master and a servant. And the servant had borrowed from the master, and it was just you know, a small amount. And, and uh, so the servant came in at the time that he was supposed to pay back the master and he threw himself on the mercy of the master. He said, I, I, have not, I don't have anything. I can't give to you. My children are depending on me. Uh, will, you, will you please forgive the loan? And so the master of this servant looked at him and he said, okay, yeah, I'll have mercy on you. And... Uh, and, and grace. Matt, uh, I'm, I'm telling the story backwards. This, this man owed a great deal. The servant owed a great deal to his master. And then after the master forgave him, this servant goes out and finds a fellow servant who only owed him a little bit. And the man came to him and said, oh, I, don't, I can't pay you. I, I, my family's depending on me. I can't pay you. And the servant, who has just been forgiven a lot, by his master, says, no, you need to pay me now. And he called for them to come and take this fellow servant and put him in prison until he could pay it all. Well, the, the word of this spread among the servants and it got back to the master. And uh, this is what the master said in Matthew 18, 32 to 35. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how the heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Yes, there may be other people who offend us. There might be people who hurt us. But God has given us much. Everything that we have comes from God. The ability to breathe, the ability to think, the ability to move, the ability to work, the, the, the ability to just to be able to, to function in this world, it all comes from God. Whatever you can look at and say, I own this, or I can use this, or I can see it and enjoy this, it all has come from God. And God has forgiven us much. Our sin put Jesus Christ on the cross. Our sin separated us from God. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, if we ask Him to be our Savior and forgive our sins, He offers His grace to us. And as recipients of God's grace, we are to offer grace to others. Jesus sums it up this way in Matthew 7, 12. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. If we are the children of God, if we are grateful for what he has forgiven us, if we're grateful for his grace and mercy that's extended to us, 
than when others hurt us or when we see others that are making wrong choices. It's not ours to judge, it's ours to forgive. It's ours to offer grace and mercy. And then the third thing that we want to notice this morning is that following Jesus requires discernment. Following Jesus desires, or, uh, requires discernment. The ability to discern truth is a necessary part of discipleship. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And sometimes, every, every time someone disagrees with someone, in our culture today, people say, oh, you hate you hate that person because you don't agree with them. Or, or you're being judgmental. But there's a difference between being judgmental and having discernment. Judgment is relating to people based on their behavior or external circumstances. We look at people and we assume something about them. And we judge them and we act to them accordingly. Sometimes we are way wrong. It's not the man's dad. It's his wife. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we're just that wrong in, in our judgment of other people. But discernment is relating to ideas, philosophies, and theologies based on the truth of God's Word. You see, in our culture today, many times even Christians call for the church to accept what God's Word clearly says is sin. It's wrong. And we need to be able to discern the truth. And we might look around and we might see other churches and other ministries that are taking sin and accepting sin. But we are to be able to discern. Some call for preaching without confronting sin. Some want salvation without the blood of Jesus. Do not confuse being non-judgmental with being gullible. So everybody who can afford to have a TV broadcast is not a prophet of God. Everyone who stands in front of a church is not a prophet of God. And you can judge, you can discern by whether or not the Word of God is being taught. If the Word of God is being taught and, being, and, and clear, then you can follow God's Word and the teaching of God's Word. But if God's Word is being twisted or if God's Word is being ignored, uh, then we need to have discernment about the truth. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 15, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. While we're not to, uh, to judge others' salvation, we are to discern the truth of the gospel from the teaching of false prophets. There is a difference. And the gate is narrow to salvation. Jesus is the only way. Jesus said that in his own words. And so when others want to tell you, well, it's okay to do this, and, 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 and you know, it's a broad way, and well, you don't really have to come through Jesus, and all the religions worship the same God. And a lot of the things that we see today... We don't need to be judgmental on people. We don't have to decide whether people are going to heaven or whether they're going to hell, whether they're living right or not living right. What we need to do is have the discernment to know the truth. And everybody who has a voice in our culture, even if they have the word church attached to it or reverend attached to it or doctor of theology attached to it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are teaching and preaching the truth. Watch out. For false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. We must discern when false teachers, while sounding good, are filling our minds with false teaching and false prophecy. Going back to our introductory story, Tony Wright 
Tony, Tony's newfound freedom comes just in time for his 45th birthday this weekend. And he said, I want to do whatever my granddaughters want to do. I want to do whatever my grandson wants to do. He told WPVI on Tuesday, I just want to be grandpa. I just want to be dad. He wasn't begrudging the past. He wasn't making accusations about the 25 years that had passed. He was focusing on the present. I just want to be grandpa. I just want to do what my granddaughters want to do. I just want to do what my grandson wants to do. I just want to be grandpa. I just want to be dad. And if you have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, you have been set free from the past. You don't have to live in the past. You don't have to carry the guilt of the past. You don't have to try to, to uh, reconcile the past. All that you need to do is receive the mercy and the grace of God. By God's grace, we have been set free from sin and guilt. And through the truth of the gospel, if you're here this morning and don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, through the truth of the gospel, you can be set free. I don't know what people in this room may be carrying. I don't know what burdens from the past. Maybe you feel like somebody else is judging you. Maybe someone else is making accusations about you. Perhaps you've maybe in your own heart and mind have not forgiven yourself for something that you have done in the past. I want to tell you this morning that the grace and the mercy of God is available to you through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's already been taken care of. It's already been paid for. Jesus already died for your sin. And this morning, you can ask Jesus to forgive your sin and be your Savior. And you can make a choice this morning to follow Jesus Christ. In my closing prayer, I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance. Asking Jesus to forgive your sin and the decision that you make to follow him. If you agree with this prayer in your heart and you say, yes, Lord, that's for me. That's where I'm at. I know I'm a sinner and I know that Jesus died for my sin. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus. And you want to begin to follow Jesus today. Just pray this prayer with me in your heart and you can leave here today knowing that your sins are forgiven. No matter who's pointing their finger, no matter who's judging, no matter who knows what may have happened in the past, it can all be forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ in this moment this morning. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your great love and mercy and grace. And Lord, as your children, sometimes we overstep the line between discernment and judgment and we become too judgmental. Sometimes in trying to avoid being judgmental, we aren't even discerning and we are led astray because we are taught by people who are not even teaching the word of God. They're teaching the philosophies of men. They're following after what is not the truth of your word. Lord, I pray today that you would remove from us any spirit of judgment on others. But Lord, that you would fill us with a spirit of discernment that we would know what is true and right. Lord, I pray that if there's any among us today who do not know you as Savior, we're so grateful that they've come today as part of this worship time to sit here and hear your word. Lord, if there's anyone who doesn't know you, may they pray this prayer with me and, and make a decision today to become your follower and to be set free from their sin. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. All human beings are born in sin. Not only am I a sinner, but I have committed acts of sin. I've committed acts of rebellion against you. I have chosen my own way. I've chosen the wrong way rather than following after you. But today I come to you and I repent. I turn around. I change my mind. I repent. And I turn from my sin 
and I turn to you, Jesus, and I ask for your blood to forgive my sin. I ask you to help me to be your child and to be a follower of yours. I choose today to follow you and to make a decision to follow you all the days of my life. Lord, I pray for every person who has prayed that prayer in their heart. May they know the forgiveness of sin. May they know the removal of guilt from their past. May they know the freedom of following after you, that they found that narrow way, Jesus Christ, the only way by which we can be saved. May you be glorified in all of our lives. And as we go, may we take the truth of your word with us. May we share the wonderful joy of the gospel of salvation with those around us. And we'll give you praise and glory for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.